and we are live. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the channel. I am just overjoyed today to have uh, the illustrious Jenny Words here on the channel. I have wanted to do uh, a conversation with Jenny for so long, uh, and so I'm really, really excited to, to finally get to. Jenny is the author of so many different books, many of which I have here uh, and that we're going to be talking about. Uh, including the Cycle of Fire, Sorcerer's Legacy, To Ride Hell's Chasm, which we're going to be giving away today, uh, and of course, the, the Wars of Light and Shadow, with the final book coming soon, Song of the Mysteries, I am so excited to get to. With that, though, Janet, I will pass it over to you, uh, if you want to just uh, give an introduction and, and tell anyone who may not know a little bit about yourself. Well... I'm an author and an illustrator at this stage, 20 novels and some 36 short works of fiction that are published. And I do most, if not all of my own illustrations. So right now that means finishing the covers which are done now for Song of the Mysteries coming out from Mark Collins Voyager. And I'm working on the special editions for the Empire series for Grim Oak Press, interiors and full wraparound cover. So I'm pretty busy with both hands. That's a lot, yeah. It's uh, the and the amount of novels that you have to is just, especially when I was thinking about it and you know trying to collect all of them. There's I mean, there is so much there, and so that's where uh, we were chatting uh, before the show too. And I'm like, I definitely want to do a more in depth uh, like interview style thing, but there's so much to talk about here that I I'm sure that we will have no trouble at all uh, with with filling plenty of time to talk about books here. And so uh, talking about the books in general and uh, your writing process, those are some things that I'm really curious on as well. So I think that's that's kind of a good starting point with what kind of got you into uh, writing and starting one common author. And was it always both writing and art? Was it one before the other? Kind of how did that, that process work? How'd you get started? Well, I was always a bit of a maverick and I always like to color outside of the lines. Um, Drawing when I was little, I would get out of bed at six, five, four years old and color by the nightlight. And my parents would come and paddle me and throw me back in bed multiple times every evening. I never wanted to sign off and say the day is finished. Um, then I went to reading and I was reading under the covers with flashlights, not because school taught me to read. It didn't. I almost became a non-reader. It was so boring. What they were having us read to learn was just impossibly dull. And I said, I'd rather be out in the woods. I would rather be trying to ride a horse. I would rather be doing anything than this. And then I discovered Walter Farley's Black Stallion series. And it was way over my reading head, but it didn't matter. I had to go after school to the library and pick those books up. So I got whacked all over again for reading under the covers with a flashlight and burning out the batteries. And I read the library growing up. And they did not have much fantasy and science fiction. I did not encounter fantasy and science fiction till just about college. So it's a long road, many, many, many books in many genres and a lot of outdoor experience, a lot of offshore sailing experience, a lot of travel that I earned money and sent myself, just immense curiosity into everything and an inability to narrow down and do just one thing. So I tended to diversify in a hundred million different directions, seriously different. Um, marine biology, um, all kinds of, I ran the telescopes for the astronomy department in college for years, all kinds of interests that, and I realized if I write, I don't have to drop any of them. Reading is an experience given to somebody else and then they make of it what they will. So a lot of, my armchair experience reading developed into actual hands-on experience in the world. And I tried to bring that back into the books as much as possible, because why not give that experience to a person that doesn't have a chance to yet or stimulate the dream to go out there and get elbow deep in something in, in real life. It's so the constant interplay between ideas and interacting with various facets of reality plus drawing there you get the alchemy behind a lot of my writing yeah that's i you can tell too with your writing just all of the breadth of different experiences and things that you look at with it uh there are so many things you can tell definitely something we'll talk about 
uh, with some of the other series, but like specifically with ships and everything, I know too that you did a lot of research. But just I think your your wide variety of interests and your desire to go there does shine through because you always you always come in and and just make it feel so real. Um, and so it's it's always an interesting time there. And I mean, it's with the writing and like the art, which you're super super talented at both. Uh, it's just very very impressive. I should probably take a look at the chat here really quick. So said, best friend to new favorite author. Hi, Andrew. And we have another Andrew. <laughs> another Andrew. Hi, Andrew. I have this sitting here to read, and I can't wait. Yes. Yes. Uh, I love that. I love that book in that series so much. Uh, we had Liam here, though, thankfully, to break up uh, the Andrews. Uh, oh yeah. He does already have uh, Hell's Chasm. Um, oh, that has so much direct experience in it. You're gonna have fun with that. I, yeah, yeah, a lot of I fun think you'll love it. it. Says he did read a book that has a cover that you designed. It yeah, it cool. does. It does. The harpy on the and the night. Do you, so this is uh, not not like specific on topic, but do you like remember vividly every cover that you you've designed or like art that you've done for a book? Or would it like take you time to like think through some of them? Probably not because I paint with hairy sticks. I work the old fashioned way. It is not digital. So executing a cover on the scale of that Lynn Abbey book would have taken me a month. Multiple drawings, multiple redrawings, multiple steps. And there would have been an art director at the publisher at the other end. So every stage that I went would have had an art director sign off. And then the actual oil painting, probably two to three weeks, um, dawn to midnight with a short time off to go jogging or ride a horse. So yeah, serious work to do both halves of the career. And when most people enter a creative career, honestly, it's all consuming. You don't get there if you don't put everything you have into it. So, you know, whether you have to steal time away from other things to do it, and still run a day job or whether you are lucky enough to do it full time. Um, my way was to run part time jobs and have just enough income to get by off part time work and freelance work for graphic design back when people did that. Um, and then pour everything into developing the books. So yeah, yeah I don't forget any any piece I ever did. And that makes sense. I mean, you can see the detail there. Um, I, I can definitely see that it's yeah I'm thinking about it too because like the amount of focus and dedication to be an author and to write and do that consistently which I know I don't have that kind of dedication nor talent for that matter, to do that and so I always appreciate uh authors so much for that but to do that and also just with you know all of the amazing artwork um and it, it's it's so impressive to to be able to do both um so I figured we definitely have to mention the art and I'll plug your website because Jandy does have prints of all kinds of amazing fantasy art uh, out on her website too. So I'll add a link to that to the description, but um, I, there's so many I want to order and it's hard to narrow down <laughs> because I'm trying to pick. I'm like, I only have so many places that they can Crazy. go. But. How can you forget a painting you ever did? The one behind me, which was one of the earliest portraits of Arathon I ever did. I did that work, I began that work when I was in college and I spent freezing cold days on Nantucket Island in December and January doing watercolor studies of the surf coming in over on Nantucket when the beach was empty. Wow. So there were studies after studies. So that storm coming in over that surf on Nantucket was worked with, with watercolors where literally the water was freezing in the jar. Oh man. And then I brought that back to the studio with oil paints and a lot of it bang right out from memory. Um, so, and, you know, that edge of wow. reality, you have to go on location sometimes. You have to take your paints. And I painted in the Bahamas in a rubber dinghy, anchored, <laughs> painting islands in the tropics um, with a paint kit or a wow. sketchbook. Or a, so, yeah, bring that, bring that back to the studio because you'll get a life and a movement that you'll never have if you only paint from photographs. Yeah, I mean, that sounds amazing. So, and I, uh, you know, I, I can see with just how detailed and, and lifelike you yeah, have with the paintings, that definitely makes a lot of sense here. 
Oh boy, we have a lot of comments in the chat that I've been neglecting. So uh, <laughs> before I get yelled at for this, let me take a look at here and then we'll start talking into the books. So we have uh, Mike Malman, another author here who uh, was a big fan of Empire Trilogy. We have Chippy Poe, I was expecting to see you here. Uh, <laughs> Channy. Oh, we have Johanna here. Oh, Johanna. Well. Hi, Johanna. And Chibi Po, everybody. Yeah, it's, it's we're getting it. And yeah, I, I definitely agree that I think I think Liam's going to really enjoy the Riot Hell's Chasm. And so does Chibi Po. Um, <laughs> we have JC and Byrne, who didn't even read Ripped War, but did read Empire. Uh, the part of my brain that likes to go in order, even if you don't need to, that just, it doesn't fit right for me. It really doesn't matter because <laughs> you, you see part I know. Seen from one side or the other, and it doesn't matter which side you see first, really. It's so arbitrary for me, but it annoys me if I don't. Uh, and I haven't done this with you, to be fair, because uh, I, I had to get to Words of Light and Shadow. But I like reading things in publication order and like series are from authors. And I'll mess that up sometimes, but like it's just this weird arbitrary thing with the way my brain works even if they're unrelated books and series my brain feels like they need to be read in the order they were published which makes no sense but um it's kind of that's kind of where it goes and yeah it's it's i know there's a read-along going on for empire and i have not gotten to it either because i'm still in the last wars of light and shadow book that's out um so <laughs> it'll it'll take some some time here yet but uh, Chippy Po on Bequest of the Master Bard, the Ships of Mary US paperback is beautiful. I'd also recommend Grand Conspiracy Cover. Those are two of my favorites, Chippy Po. So you have great taste because I know the exact ones. Uh, they're so good. And there there are a couple of the like the other just nature pieces too that I really love, but I, I wanted to get one of the the Arathon ones. Um, and yeah, Liam, that's it's Don and Janny are married. So that's, yeah, there's uh, between the two of them, tons of crazy art uh, as well as writing there too. Yeah, These we had to build a giant studio to accommodate both of us. So the art studio that we share is huge. Yeah, it's Liam's a big fan of like uh, a lot of Sword and Sorcery Forgotten Realms and like kind of those kinds of things. So I imagine there's, there's plenty of uh, art pieces that Don's done in that oh, space. Oh, yes. That style, oh, yeah. so. <clears throat> we already got people pointed to the website. That's a win. But we haven't even started talking about the books yet, which I definitely want to talk about. And so since I just made a big deal about arbitrarily wanting to go in order, why don't we arbitrarily go in order? Why not? And talk about it uh, with, the, with the early stuff. Um, and so I think as far as like full novels, Sorcerer's Legacy was the, the first Very one. first. Yep. Very first. And this is, I know you, uh, from talking to you in the past, this is kind of supposed to be a little bit more of a simple one, but. Um... It's a total anomaly. It is a complete mistake <laughs> because it's a court intrigue romance, but not oh, a really? romance, but it's, there's a strong romantic thread and it happened because of an accident. I was working on a piece, uh, a piece of artwork which became the inspiration for Cycle of Fire, or it was supposed to be the original cover for Cycle of Fire that they did not use. I and I had an art agent at the time who was going overseas to Britain and she was gonna take the painting to show at the art show in London for the World Convention. And she had to fill out the customs form six months in advance. And she kept asking me, what's the sale price? What's the sale price? Well, the agreement I had with her was, you can sell any piece of art I ever do, but you cannot sell anything that's to do with the story. Actually, it was Sorcerer's Legacy, excuse me. So I had this painting on the easel that I was just painting and it was like 90 degrees, 95 degrees outside, 106 in my studio. It was hot. I had no air conditioning. I was in a field hands quarters apartment over a carriage house that I rented on a farm so here I am boiling. So I decided to paint this painting in a snowstorm, freezing cold, because I didn't want to be thinking about how I was dripping sweat. So what happened, she tried to put a sale price on it and it wasn't done. I had to do the jewels in, in, in colored pencil because there wasn't time to finish the paint. So I kept saying, you can't sell it, it's not finished. And she kept turning the deaf ear. So finally I said, there's a story attached. So I sat down and I wrote 18 pages of melodramatic 
dribble, buried the heroin in so much trouble, nobody could ever dig her out of it again, threw it in the file box, slammed the door and said, unfinished story, you can't sell the painting. Well, that shut down the agent. <laughs> Meantime, I had a few friends that came over and we sort of writer workshops um, once a month. And it had been so hot, they all had nothing. They had nothing to read, nothing to write. Nobody had been working. And I said, I'll fix these turkeys. I will give them this 18 page piece of dribble and I'll let them read it. And God, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They said, what happens next? And I said, ha ha, snort, there's no ending to this. And then I said, oh, there is a way she could get out of this. So I wrote it and it sold as my first novel, but it's kind of different than anything else I've done before or since, but it led to the empire because Ray read it and liked it. And that's what made him ask me to collaborate to write Mara. Ah, so, so well. Anyway, Empire now series and that order. book are kind of a rabbit hole in a totally different direction because at the time I was developing Master of White Storm and I was developing uh, short stories originally and I was developing Wars of Light and Shadow continuously in the background. So all these other projects happened at the same time. I think oh, I'm frozen. Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So I was going to say, at least uh, <laughs> uh, I'm going to try turning the camera off and on to see if that unfreezes it. But as long as you can at least hear me, um, I don't know what happened there. Um, OK, well, um, I was going to say, uh, it's we, we got out of order. But since you mentioned that was where, and I'm holding up Daughter of the Empire now uh, <laughs> on camera here uh, with it. Let me try one more thing. Uh, da, da. Dark Nico. Darkness. I don't think it likes my camera for some reason. Why is it not recognized? We are experiencing technical difficulties. Please wait. I will <laughs> be back with you shortly. Aha! Yeah, Look. <laughs> Gotta have a little chaos in the stream here. Uh, <clears throat> So yes, but so Daughter of the Empire, because uh, I was going to ask uh, how how that kind of came along and said that was actually from Sorcerer's Legacy, the book you didn't even well, like. Sorcerer's Legacy came out and Ray had published Magician. And I was had written Cycle of Fire. I was working on that, but which was originally a two book series. And I was well into working with Master of Whitestorm, which was sold. So I had plenty of projects on my plate. Um, I didn't need another project. So Magician fell into the hands of Dawn to illustrate the cover for the paperback. So Ray and Dawn got to talking and Dawn got me to read Magician and Ray decided he wanted to do this story that started with this young girl and the other culture on the other side of the rift, which was largely undeveloped. So he bothered me and bothered me and bothered me and said, I don't want to write a teenage girl. And I said, Ray, <laughs> Write it anyway, and I will stand in the background and tell you where you got it wrong. I'm happy to advise on this as much as you want, but I have all these other projects, and I want to do Light and Shadows. I really want to get to that. So he kicked me for about two years. He just kept on my case for about two years. Um, and finally, I caved in because the lure of working with a very different culture and making it extremely Machiavellian those Machiavellian politics with this young girl threading through, eventually this story just got to me and I realized it would be great fun to write this. So, but he had to really lobby for it. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I love it. Cause that is, it's not like the story you would expect to hear for something like that, especially, a, you know, a beloved trilogy. Um, I'm really excited to read it as well, but just, it was like, Hey, can you can you write this? Uh, no, I don't want to do it. <laughs> Eventually, getting into it with it, but I can I can definitely understand when you've got you know a lot of, of stuff going on. Um, but I mean, it makes sense, and it probably worked out with Don involved for the art as well, so that you know he had an easy way to contact you. Worst case. <laughs> well, actually, I did the first cover for Daughter in paperback. 
That was my yeah. art. And then oh, Don yeah, started yeah. on to do the rest of it. Um, so it went back and forth. It's gone back and forth all over the place. So I'm doing the special editions for Grimrock Pesh right now. And yeah, Don's doing cool. all the magician side for Grimrock Press. So we sort of have old things coming back around, but in a different form. It's going to say that is going to cost me so much money uh, <laughs> to get those, but I can't help it. I even have my copy of Magician is, uh, it's a, it was this old special hardcover, which I think has, a, has Don's cover on it. Um, that's what I think. Maybe um, it's over here. Oh. That's fine. Oh yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Which is super cool. But I do love to like that, you know the stuff that you you guys have collaborated on oh i messed that shelf up bad okay which like the fiona bar tapestry that was the only really official one i was gonna say i think yeah it's as chippy Pum mentioned that one specifically the fiona bar, yeah we did one giant painting that was all three covers and they split it paid us for one painting got three covers out of it that was the original deal but i love guy case work so much i said don we have to take this we just have to take this I, I've seen I've seen your pieces, which they are absolutely beautiful. And uh, he is an author that I am so excited to read, and I've still not read any of his books. I own oh, Lions so of many of his books. Lions of Alrasen, start there. I'm pretty sure I have that one too. I have collected so many of his books over the years, and then he's just one of those authors I haven't yet gotten to. Uh, but I, I'm definitely excited. So maybe that'll be my. Uh, project that I have some time for after finishing your series. Uh, so I'll have a lot more time this year. Uh, I wanted so to ask you a question. <laughs> yeah. What you are one of the first among the booktubers, you're among the earlier crowd who's read the whole thing just rammed right through. When you started this, what changed your expectations? What surprised you about the series? What what did you not expect that this series was based on hearsay or whatever? So, what um, yeah, that is, that's a great question. And really, I didn't know a ton about it when I first started because I had, I randomly found this copy of Cycle of Fire, which is beat up and like taped. Uh, but I randomly found this in a used bookstore and I'm like, okay, that's an awesome cover. I'm getting this immediately. And I read it and I really enjoyed it. And then uh, when I was talking about that, I had a couple people say, oh, if you think that's good, you have to check out her Wars of Light and Shadow series. And so I start kind of digging into it. Uh, and I'm like, oh, this looks like this big, you know, epic fantasy type thing. And it was one where it took me a while to get to it. And then I read like the prologue and I'm like, oh, this seems good. But I was very much expecting uh, the more kind of classical fantasy type thing light versus shadow good versus evil and uh i start reading and you very quickly see that it's not that simple and then i come to realize that nothing is ever that simple but the big thing for me is with reading the first book i knew i was going to continue the series uh but it was the second book where i fell in love because with the first book curse the mystery i still feel like i had too many uh, like predisposed thoughts about what the series was. And I hadn't fully yet realized just how wrong I was. Uh, and book book two really, really brought that to light. And um, it's, so yeah, it's it, it definitely presents as if it's going to be this very classical kind of, you know, tropey type of story. <laughs> it is anything but. And then just the further I got, man, I could, I just couldn't wait and do one a month despite, you know, these taking a while and I've still been taking my time reading them despite binging them, but just uh, just so good and, and so different from anything else I've ever read. So that's kind of the, that's the big thing is, it's not just like, oh my gosh, this is really good. It's not only is it amazing, but it's also so unique and so different from anything else. It's, it's like a wholly original work and yeah, there are elements you can pull and see that, you know, might be similar is some small pieces to anything with any story, but just so much here that's new, that's different, the scope, the world building. And uh, I love world building so much. And so <laughs> the way you do it also as well, where it's, we're not just stopping for info dumps. We're, we're just like learning about it as we go. And you may think things are one way when they really are not. And so. 
it has been just the most absolute wild ride. I feel like that was kind of a rambling answer, but I hope that answered your Yeah, well, answer. you're in, in ARC 4 now. To me, it really, really breaks the envelope after Peril's Gate. And so few people see that. Excuse me, I got a cat going to knock things down if I don't. Yeah. She says, you're busy. You can't be interrupted. So I'm going to go on to the shelf and start pushing fragile things onto the floor. Yeah, that's a cat. That's a cat for sure. <laughs> She's got the devil in her. But anyway, so yeah, it was, I built it in very slow stages, not like Malazan, which throws the whole pie on the table and smashes it in pieces and you spend 11 books putting it together. In this case, the fun part now is in arc four, I bet you can look back at book one and say it's a totally different story. All I, the pieces were in plain sight, but you didn't know what to value. Yeah. And there's a, uh, the, my my biggest uh and, and my biggest probably but really my only one complaint about curse the mist wraith was wholly because uh and i won't say what although i feel like it'll be evident to everyone who's read it a certain big plot line seems to be wrapped up way too quickly and easily <laughs> little did i know at the time that it is anything but and so especially the fact that I'm on, you know, book nine or 10, depending on how you count it right now, and certain elements are still a huge, huge plot point. I'm just like, man, was I ever wrong? In Wait till you get to Song of the Mystery. Song wow. of the Mysteries, you're going to go back to Curse of the Mystery, and you're going to look at some of the things that occur in volume one, and you're going to realize how deep the waters were beneath some of those events. And it's all in plain sight. But yeah, song is going to shatter the floor out from under you all over again. The tiebacks to the entire series, all the way back to book one, all the way back to everything. Um, so that was the whole plan. That was the plan. So yeah, is it a complaint that I'm sure readers are going to say my expectations were crushed because this big plot point wasn't a big plot point in book one? Wait for it. Yeah. Wait for it, because the main impetus of what is running beneath what you think is happening is much bigger and other and has a lot more involved in it. And and that's why with the series in general, uh, my like my biggest tips besides pay attention, which <laughs> is a given, uh, but it's just be, being patient reading because uh you're you're not an author who's like like purposely like hiding and you know you know not wanting to tell us what's actually going on or asking all these questions with no answers like the answers are there we just sometimes need to know and experience a lot more before that we can see what the answer is and understand it but also it's you answer the questions like anything that i was curious on or that I'm like, oh my gosh, I wonder what's going on here or what's going to happen here. Even these little things, like I've gotten answers or I know answers are still coming, you know? And so there are so many things uh, that I think too, like, like you know, um, with looking at this, that, or the other thing, and it's just be patient, see how it plays out, trust the process, because I can I can 100% confirm, Jenny, that you, you always make it work and make it worthwhile even if i have to wait a while for some things heck i was just talking to you about something that happened for the first time on screen in in the book that i'm on and i'm like i've been waiting since like book two for that i think uh so you're, you know, you're in destiny's conflict which what chapter set are you in uh i'm in destiny's conflict i'm still very early oh i think it was in initiates trials what i'm talking about oh okay I, I, yeah um, oh, the big hammers fall in Destiny's Conflict. You wait yeah. for it. It's coming. But yeah, there I, are some so people who just have to have the answers up front going in. You know, they're the ones that have their hand in the air telling, asking questions to the teacher immediately. And then they're the introverts who sit in the back and wait for some other fool to ask that question or are willing to wait for it and, and watch it come together. And certain personalities don't get along with the series, the big series, like my mother, because she would always say, I don't understand this. And I'd say, read just two more pages, <laughs> read the next paragraph. 
the explanation is coming. And if it's too deep for you right now, it will come in due time. So that attitude of having the patience to wait for something and trusting the author to deliver, some personalities don't like that. For sure. And I, I've seen, uh, there are some other series I've read too, where like the big complaints are just like, oh my gosh, this author has just lost track of what they're writing or like has lost control of the story. And I'm like, no, if you keep reading and just trust the process, like all of these things are resolved. Uh, and there's, I, I've seen some that sometimes it's just people, they're, they're not patient or, you know, maybe they haven't paid as much attention to the small details to kind of see uh, the little bits and pieces, but it's, it's, yeah, it, it worth a light and shadow. It's a series that you, you do have to trust the process um, because it's, you'll get what you want and you'll get all of your expectations subverted, all the tropes subverted. And uh, it's just uh, such a powerful series and such an amazing series. And honestly, you have to realize that it. many of these were not designed as long form works Light and Shadows was designed in 1972 and developed till 1993. The first volume was sold complete, fully written, fully polished, all done. So the intricate layers and levels were already worked out. That's why I know exactly where I'm going, but there are many series ongoing today where they were done pantser. Yeah. And there's a little bit of little wobble in the steering because the author was figuring out their way or they got tired and they added a new character to give it some, I didn't do it that way. So definitely if you wait, it will deliver, but you're not going to get it. I'm not going to tip my hand before the story is ready to deliver that knowledge explosively. And if it doesn't move all the markers, I'm going to wait until it does. So it's definitely designed, planned as a long form work. And there's no slop in the gears. When you get to Song of the Mysteries, you'll realize how little slop in the gears there ever was in any of it. Even if you read a scene, you go, this is just window dressing. No. I will pull that point back. If I showed you that scene, there was a purpose behind it somewhere. Oh, I always believe it. I always believe it. But, oh, man, I just, I, I haven't even finished Destiny's Conflict yet. And I'm just, I'm just so overjoyed, excited for Song of the Mysteries now, too. And um, I um, I have a feeling I'm going to get through Destiny's Conflict very quickly after this conversation. Because every time I talk to you, I have to compulsively keep reading the series. Because I'm already so excited and so engaged. But then I talk to you and, like, I don't think the excitement and engagement levels can go up. But they do. Uh <laughs> They always do. Oh, man. Uh, let me check over really quick here. Um, sorry, guys. As long as uh, Anitha's not here, she always yells at me if I neglect the chat. I don't know if she's... <laughs> let me see where I left off here. Uh, Andrew confirming. Yeah, he's doing Master of White Storm. We got Angie in the house. Hi, Angie. Hello. Uh, Chibi Poe educating about Master of White Storm. Uh, uh, as everybody should be, everybody should read more Janny words for sure. Well, Master of White Storm was originally conceived as a bunch of short stories that were sequential. It became novelized because the editor who bought Sorcerer's Legacy wanted to buy it as an epic fantasy. So don't let the episodic nature of the sword and sorcery beginnings fool you. It is actually an in-depth examination of the psychological underpinnings of the legendary hero. And by the midpoint of the book, all that stuff's going to start to come together and it will barrel forward as a cohesive story. But it's if you like a single hero, if you like a small cast, if you like uh, an adventures in, cited in different places in the world, um, that's a good place to start. And the audio, which was narrated by Simon Preble, he knocked it out of the park. He totally nailed that. Beautiful job. So there is audio for that one available. Um, you can test it out on the website. I think I got the first chapter up of his performance. So that's a good choice for Between Empire and the Depth of Light and Shadows. I'm, I'm going to end up 
doing it in like reverse order, but I did at least read uh, Cycle of Fire first, but then I jumped straight into Wars of Light and Shadow, and then I'm going to go back and read all these other ones. But but yeah, it's uh, uh, especially with, it, that sounds really interesting with kind of the episodic uh, sword and sorcery format, which uh, I mean, there's a lot of that stuff and I haven't read a ton of it. Uh, but I'll be curious to see. That was the perfect segue to talk about this book a little more, though, since we hadn't. So this is why I like to keep them casual. Just let it flow. We'll get there. We'll get where we need to go eventually. Oh, it. there's fun stuff in that book. There's mountaineering, which I've done a bit of. Um, not in winter conditions. I read the Alpine journals over and over and over to get the detail. And then I bounced it off of friends of mine. And my editor at the time was a climber. Oh, really? So, And I had done um, mountaineering in outward bound. So there's a lot of sailing in that. There's shipbuilding. There's all kinds of little things um, woven into that book. So even though it was what I consider more one of my lighter works, it handles some pretty heavy themes. Um, and a lot of life experience went into it. So it's I, not I, such a lightweight book in that regard. Well, and that's what, so it's even something that's like, you know, you consider a lighter one. Yeah. And like I said, like literally the, the amount of research you do into the, the climbing, sailing, mountaineering, shipbuilding, those kinds of things. It just, it brings such an air of authenticity to the works too, because it's just like with some of those things, you're going to details of things I don't know, but I, I like very, very automatically trust because it's so detailed and seems so authentic that I'd absolutely just, you know, expect that you know what you're talking about. Um, oh, Joanna just finished Lions of Oh, beautiful book. My favorite K book ever. Beautiful book. I'm, I'm really excited for that one now, too. So on the list of favorite standalones with Hell's Chasm. Oh, and Andrew Meredith wants to buddy read uh, Lions. So uh, I'm definitely deaf. <laughs> it might have to be a little later this year before I can fit it in. Oh, and Angie's doing in August. So of course, I think I'm getting roped into a buddy read, Janie. This is this is all on you, but I'll thank you for it later. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yes, there we go. Wars of Light and Shadow first. You still need to finish Curse of the Mist Wraith. So yeah, he's going to take a while, but he's enjoying every word, which is fun to watch. Yeah, it, it's it's I, I love seeing people really look and analyze it like that because it's like even the first book when we know nothing there's so much to look into so uh pretty pretty great oh and this was when we were talking about expectations and yeah thinking classic good versus bad two brothers but uh <laughs> very yeah, very a lot more than that it is a whole lot more than that and was always meant to be a whole lot more than that yeah. that was just the frame around which to build everything else and yeah, uh, Andrew Meredith, he's been asking some great questions. I've had to be very political in how I respond. Uh, and so it's now that I'm like so far in the series. Too, how many rolls I, of duct tape? I know. I feel your pain so much because there's so many things I've gotten to. I'm like, how was Janie able to keep a straight face while we were theorizing about this, where these things are going? Oh, my gosh. So, yeah, it's it's asking so many questions, but there's there's quite a lot. Oh, and we have YouTube glitch. It's all waiting for you, Andrew. It's all waiting for you. Oh, so much. Uh, once Song of Mysteries is out, people can read it. What would you hope people would feel when they go back and reread the opening prologue in Curse of the Mystery, having had the opportunity to read Song of the Mysteries? That's an insightful Guess question. what? It's not going to be clean cut as you think. <laughs> Nothing is going to be as clean cut as you think. And there is an epilogue to Song of the Mysteries that bookends the prologue of Curse of the Mistraith. I don't want to say too much because the book is going to deliver in ways you cannot yet imagine. You know I have this habit of solving something or answering something or finishing a major plot point only to blow the bottom out of the box. Song of the Mysteries is going to do that all over because Arc 4 finishes off quite a few things that you would think would come in the finale. And that isn't the finale. Song of the Mysteries, the elder powers come to the fore. And if you go back to the early books, you will see they were there all along. 
Just power on this world walks exceedingly softly. It does not explode across the page, except that it does. If you reread Curse of the Mistraith and you read certain of the encounters with certain of those elder powers, in the beginning, you'll realize, oh my God, the author told me straight out on the page. This sentence absolutely says this straight <laughs> out on the page, but because you weren't expecting to see that you brought your own baggage to the table, your own assumptions to the table, your own worldview to the table, your own history to the table. You didn't see the contour of what was really happening entirely. And that was designed to be that way. It is meant to smash your thinking. It is meant to break the envelope on what you thought you saw. So exactly, you pick it up, you think it's a classical tropey fantasy. I didn't tell you that. I told you in the prologue, it was not going to be that. But you're so trained to listen to fantasy as this, that it's going to blow your mind. And it's going to blow your mind because history educates us what war is. It educates us what honor is. It educates us what we're taught. We fall into our own beliefs. And you're going to bring those assumptions to the table here. And it's going to blind you just as it blinds us every day. And this series was designed to break that, tear off that blindfold in ways that you are not going to expect. And then you're going to go, oh, my God, how did I, how did I keep that assumption in place so long and see i'm gonna be it's gonna be so hard uh, this is gonna be the new series that i'm constantly fighting off the urge to reread uh, if you do you sure. will see a thousand more things that you didn't oh see. I, I will reread this series probably dozens of times over the rest of my life but uh i just have to space it out a little bit maybe not <laughs> dozens but uh it's yeah definitely that's all the more reason too that uh uh if we uh we keep pressuring the publisher for some audio uh copies too uh audio works really great for rereads Please. so that I, I don't have to go so slow that's what i did uh that was how i kind of first tried out audio because i hadn't really used it is the wheel of times the series i've reread a bunch of times and i'm like well i want to do a reread but i don't really have the time to devote that so why don't i just do the audio and listen through and then now i, I really enjoyed it so so yeah, it's it's definitely Keep the pressure a on. Cool I would thing. really like to see that happen because the yeah. prose is made for that. And I think a lot of the small details and the a lot of the shading and the nuance of the prose will come forward because it was designed, it was written to be read aloud. Yeah, it's there there are just there are so many parts too where you read it and then you just have to like stop and read it to yourself out loud because just there's there's so many beautiful parts there. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll read uh, parts of it out to my wife sometimes too, uh, just with it. So yeah, it's I, I'm starting. I'm doing audio for Destiny's Conflict uh, by Colin Mace, and I just like it's so nice to to finally just hear it read out loud. So so everybody watching, make sure you send uh, Harper a message and tell them we were Harper audio. Voyager UK. Harper Voyager UK. London. If you complain to the U.S. division, they're just going to not do anything about it. <laughs> they're like, I don't know what you want. You got the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, oh, they, they, they need to do this. They just plain need to do this. 100%. Uh, just wait a page is my motto, too. It might be more than a page. I think that's talking about with getting the answers. Sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's but... not. And sometimes you'll get the explanation and you won't be able to interpret it fully because your own assumptions are going to blind you. It, you know, those Asandir always answers the question. He never dodges the question. He will hit the tack right on the head. He won't elaborate. He won't sidestep. He won't, he will hit the tack on the head, but do you have the depth of experience to understand what he is saying? 100%. Uh, and then we have beauty of the series that you think you know the direction the story is going to take, and you think you know the themes and the nature of the characters, but then book by book, Janny dismantles that. Very true. Yeah, it's and and you I found in the series too. There'll be characters that you know I make my gut reaction to immediately, and I'm like, oh, I like this character. I don't like this character, or like I I make that assumption, and then it's almost like you're purposely like. <laughs> Oh, uh, let's see though. What do you think? 
And it's not even like, you know, you take a character and try to make us change the way we think. You just, like the character is alive and you force us to see them as a person that has flaws, you know, that they have merits and they have, you know, good, bad, negative, they're a person. And it just makes you really think about it. And like when I was watching uh, the, uh, the conversation with uh, Philip and AP Canada and Joanna, and he was talking about in the first book, how a character who is objectively a very bad person, but uh, at the end, they were just like, you know, I, I kind of fell for him and I could admire these positive qualities even though he was doing terrible things and with it. And so it's just the, the complexity and the beauty and the authenticity, 100%. Well, they were talking about Pesquil <laughs> and you hate Pesquil, but yes. you know, if you wanted a cause and you wanted somebody at your back, Pesquil's the man you want. So yeah. the whole idea that every quality has to be present in one leader is so fallacious. Because honestly, you don't want Patton at the peace table. So a heroic quality in one scene might become a disaster in another scenario. That the very qualities that make a character strong and good in one case may make them exactly who you don't want running things in another. And that, yeah, I flip that all the time um, where the, the character's key. strength can become their greatest weakness. What uh, what two characters have we seen a lot of that theme with over the course of the series? Well, I, my duct tape role is very handy. You'll have to read and find out. But yeah, there's some that you're going to absolutely love when they walk on and you will hate them for being the wrong person at the wrong time. And there are others that you will hate, but they might be the right person at the right time in another moment or they might learn something that changes their perspective and it makes them behave differently. People either grow from making a mistake or they fall back into that mistake and justify it. And you will see both. You will see yeah. characters do both. And it, it's, it's you, you have the unparalleled ability to make me, even if I don't like a character, to make me care about them uh, still anyway. And there have been a lot of examples of that, but it's just, uh, you make me care about what's happening. And it's never like, you know, sometimes an author will, you know, they'll have a character that's terrible and then they like kill them off and it's supposed to be satisfying as a payoff for the reader. Or, you know, they, they have the good character, they make something terrible having to make you care. But you just make me care because you kind of show me really who these people are and them as a whole human being. And it's just, it's hard not to. And so very, very impressive. I... I'm still a full 12 minutes behind on the chat because <laughs> there's so much to talk about. Uh, we have uh, Chippy Poe with her. Uh, love the construction of the world, how it felt like this was a wild, majestic, but also terrible world. There were mages and such, but also terrors that humanity has little defense against. But some of these were just things that were kind of uh, not concerned with humankind at all, elementals like cyanide. So it's uh, from Master of White Storm. So. Shandi yeah. is the pronunciation there. If you're absolutely getting twisted up. Shandi. I, I absolutely read yeah. that in my brain as a word that I, yeah. I knew how to pronounce, but I see is spelled completely differently. It's spelled so. weird, right? <laughs> but it's an elemental, you know? It's an elemental. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be something humans would be comfortable with. So okay. yeah, I play with the words that way all the time. It's just the brain shoots out uh, what it thinks the word is for sure. I don't care how people pronounce things. I really honestly don't. It's I feel like I've I've actually for the most part gotten most of the pronunciations for things right. Um, although I also learned in that that stream on Joanna's channel that it's pronounced gesh and not geese because I've always said geese. Um, but I feel okay because even Colin Mace pronounces it like I do. So I feel, I feel justified in thinking that's the pronunciation. Uh, I was, I was wondering then, cause I would have never in a million years guessed. Yes. You don't want to get into how to pronounce Gaelic. I used to play years and years and years in pipe <laughs> bands. You don't want to go into how to pronounce Gaelic. I mean, Kaylee, C-E-I-L-E-I-D-H. Honest. They make it opaque on purpose. <laughs> I love it. I love it to pieces. 
I love my Scottish friends. I love listening to Gaelic being spoken. I love their crazy spellings. But yeah, how would you know in a word like geish? You would not know. Yeah. And so honestly, I don't care how people pronounce things because I'll just wipe it off saying, yeah, you got a town accent. So what? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great way of looking at it. I love that. Uh, oh, we have another question here from uh, Andrew DeMeredith. What aspects of Lysair and Arathon are most obviously a part of your personality? Well, I would like to say probably I draw from negative ego on Lysair. When you absolutely feel like you have to justify that you are right and you don't want to listen. But it goes beyond anything that I would look in. I also look out and I see what happens when people decide to hero worship and decide that this person knows everything and can do no wrong. And then you have to defend it. It's like try saying a word against a really popular fantasy author and look what happens. You get jumped on no matter what you said, whether you had a point or not. So look at where your own beliefs and your ego gets in the way of actually seeing the broader picture. So that would be Lysair. And we have leaders, we have fanatics, we have people who can create cults. We look at what disinformation does to people. We look at what happens when you have a preset idea of what is right and that is right. My faith says this is right. What happens when something comes along and it matches that template exactly? If you don't question yeah. that faith, if you don't question that ideal, if you don't question ever, you are a tool for whatever steps up that fits that ideal. And then you're going to blindly be used. So that's the aspect of Lysair. But there's more to Lysair than that. And you will see this in ARC 4 in particular and also in ARC 5. Um, Arathon, what happens when somebody has complete compassion and they can't say no to anything that's cruel? What happens when you're bleeding hearts on your sleeve every minute? First, you're going to have to defend yourself because you'd be people would be seeing into your inner pain all the time. So look at that sharp aspect of his character. It's a defense, but also it's a weakness because you can never draw a boundary against suffering. You can never say, no, I can't care about this. You can never filter what's going on around you. So both qualities, Lysair's justice, his ability to filter everything to fit that template of justice or to go, let's go for the good of the many and not the individual. Whereas Arathon, he has to look at the individual first and the bigger picture second. He's also initiate master, he's been trained. So a lot of what you think you know about him, he may keep hidden. And there are moments in the series where his vision, his inner vision will be unlocked, but you're not going to see it on the page all the time. It will be a rare moment because power on that scale does not speak in broad daylight. It speaks when it's asked and it's very careful what it reveals or it would destroy itself or he would destroy himself. So what is he protecting? What is he guarding? So the introvert that is protecting and is difficult to get along with, often those are the most vulnerable people inwardly. They're shielding themselves and you don't know what that shield is built against unless you're very quiet and very patient, you're going to miss it. And that's where most of Arathon's friends misinterpret what he's doing because they don't take the time to back off, wait for it, or give him the benefit of the doubt and say, wait a minute, you never do anything without purpose. What is that purpose? They'll jump to a conclusion before that purpose has been revealed. And then he will protect that purpose you're not gonna get in the door. So I think every character in every book, you have to tap into some facet, but is that yourself or is that a piece of the world that rubs yourself wrong? And you say, you know, I wish people had more patience here or I wish they handled that situation differently or I wish they took the time to understand that person who had a bad hair moment. So writing is very personal, but it's also about reaction, not just inner action or inner thought. It's both. Asandir said it plainly, the truth has many facets and the only unsplintered view is found from within. 
I, and yeah, that was that was such an incredibly insightful answer. Um, and I, it, it's that right there, just talking about the characters and their personalities and how deeply we get to know those characters and see all the the facets of them. It's just another, I feel like, glowing uh, endorsement for the series here. Uh, it's, Andrew does agree with the great answer here. Uh, it looks like, oh, he's, so he's planning on finishing Curse this week. Um, we got Chad joining. That last scene, that last two chapter sets. Yeah. I, yep. I'm imagining I'm going to have some furious uh, messages from him typing very quickly to me. Uh, to you support. think it's going to blow your socks off and burn them up? <clears throat> That's just <laughs> ground floor, babe. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and let's see. Oh, so Andrew asking, putting me on the spot, uh, Jannie Words versus Robert Jordan, uh, asking if Wheel of Time has finally been dethroned as my favorite series. Now, according to my own rules, I cannot make this determination until I've finished Wars of Light and Shadow completely and read the whole book, but I think you can figure out the answer. <laughs> I always have a rule. No unfinished series uh, can can officially make it, because the one time I broke that rule, I the author of the ending of the series ruined some stuff for me. And so I'm like, not gonna oh, happen. I know that's not going to happen with you. Yeah, not going to happen. That's why I, I feel comfortable saying it anyway. I'm pretty but confident. Yeah. And I'll make sure you get an ARC. I'll make sure. I cannot wait. I'm literally going to be dropping everything and immediately starting that, no matter what I'm in the middle of. So. I don't like the, the idea of hierarchy in writers. I think they each have their place for the, the what they were driving to do. And what Robert Jordan was driving to do, he probably accomplished really, really well. I came to the Wheel of Time a little bit later in life, so it didn't work for me as well as for some readers um, because he was driving for something different. To me, if a character goes through a major war or a major event, they're going to come out different and changed. So I think in, in many ways, Jordan was writing for a certain segment of the audience and he hit that target dead on. I was going for something different, different. There's not wish fulfillment in the Wars of Light and Shadows. There is no anything for a teenage boy to go, oh yeah, this is wish fulfillment. The women are gonna act just the way I want them to, or, or you know, there's no generalization in that way. So it's a different audience. So I would rather say that every author has some facet to write about and they they hit that target well or they miss because maybe their craft is a little blurry yet and they need to tighten things up as far as knowing how to put the word on the page but you can't hierarch writing you can't do that you can't say this dethrones that because it's all individual and it's different and wouldn't we all hate it if everything was alike when we all hated it, if, if one book was the top of the pyramid and everything else was considered inferior, that's not how we're made. Oh yeah, and it's it's with with me like I because I I have a ranking and it's the ranking of my favorite series. So it's not saying this is objectively better than this or this is that because look, my favorite list specifically is a lot of series that a lot of people probably would not care for uh, because I I read a lot of stuff that just it doesn't work for everybody. And so it's it's totally fine, but yeah, it's a. Uh, I just uh, I've never read anything like Wars of Light and Shadow, and I it, it's one of those series that you know you you find something that's just your favorite that you're engaged that you just can't put down that just ticks every box, and you think, okay, I am I ever gonna find something like this again? And so when you do, and you find a series that just absolutely has everything you want out of it it is just it's amazing and and I, I definitely love that and so it's my in my favorite list is pretty diverse because it's i mean everything from wheel of time to the green bone saga to uh, some michael r fletcher on there and uh tad williams and like there's my favorite list is is all kind of all over the place so um the older you get that. the more you have a favorite list that gets bigger and bigger because each of your favorites has a different facet that did, did superbly well. Mm -hmm. And you can't- It gets harder and harder every Yeah, you year. can't. So when everybody says, you know, vote for your favorites, I put I would put 50 books on that list at this stage. I, yeah. Seriously, 
fifth. Well, and you and you're so well read too, and that's like I, um, I have so many. I I've I consider myself decently well read, but there are still so many series that I want to get to, both including like backlist series and newer series, and so there's just so much stuff to get to. Um, but then you know. And I, I don't love everything I read, but I found so many great things, whether they were older books or newer books that I've enjoyed. And so it's it's always hard to kind of narrow that stuff down. When we had on the Arathon part, uh, Joanna was saying it sounds like an empath, uh, but usually can't distinguish their feelings from those around them. Which I think Arathon would, I mean, like he can definitely... You know, he's distinguishing, he knows the, the feelings there, but he does kind of have to feel what people feel uh, in a way. So I think that makes sense. Uh, da -da. He can distinguish his feelings, but it's going to skew the compass because of that compassion. That gift of compassion means he can't tune it out. He has to reckon with it. So if you dump a problem into his lap, he's going to have to either shield and sharply turn it, turn you away break that thread of connection, make you disengage, or he's going to have to engage it. So empaths definitely know what they feel, but it might take the person that's skewing the compass leaving the room. Then it's going to become plain what they felt all the way along. So the empath is the one who doesn't have the ability to filter until that distraction removes itself from the picture. So I wouldn't call Arathon 100% empathic. He is, and yet he isn't, because you're talking about a master initiate who has been trained. You're talking about a character which, when you get into the later series, you will learn how he was trained. He was not taught to respond to praise. He was taught to respond to his own inner compass, first of all. So that inner compass is never gone. The question is how much he will allow that compass to be skewed and why. And that's part of unlocking his personality as you go through the books. It's not simple. 100%. It's definitely not simple. And he is not above leading you astray. He wants you to think something. He will do something and let you draw your conclusion. And he will leave that conclusion in place and not upset your apple cart because it was in his design. He wanted you to keep that assumption in place. Watch for it. Watch for it. He's not going to tell you different just because. It's like, figure it out yourself. And if oh, you definitely. can't, step in it. <laughs> yeah, 100%. So I do want to uh, transition to, because we have a couple of other uh, books to talk about. See, this is where, like I said, we'll, we'll definitely, we'll have to get a, do a follow-up at some point, because this has been fantastic. But I, I knew that uh just with talking about the books that you know we'd have so much to talk about so i want to ask uh next we'll jump back uh to that way likes camelot which is a collection of uh short stories uh that are, are following king arthur um which i still haven't read this one yet either i do i absolutely love this cover as well i want to know i don't know what it is it's like i don't know that it's anything specifically it's just everything all of the elements combined it's just so aesthetically pleasing to me um uh, but what about this one so what made you uh want to write this kind of thing with the, the collection of shorts or how did that come to be most of the time when i was asked to write a short piece i had to force it to stay short and not become a novel so in the case of the cover painting for That Way Like Camelot, I did that painting out of sheer enjoyment of painting something. I just was playing with the paint, playing with imagery, And it was the first time that I had to write a story because somebody loved the cover so much. I had to go write a story. So Marianne I, Zimmer Bradley was like, I understand that. we want this for the cover of our magazine, but we always have a story attached. So I had to write the story <laughs> to the cover. Um, so that collection is, is really eclectic. I mean, there's one story I wrote in there that was practically done in high school. There are stories that are science fiction. There are stories that are mainstream fantasy. The title story um, has a child dying of leukemia. And that was my four-year-old cousin who died at four that I never met. But I knew him through my cousin, his older sister, and I knew him through his mother, my aunt. So that story was dedicated to him. And I crossed it through the King Arthur legends because I was told to write a grail story. 
And my habit of writing short stories is really different. I tend to experiment heavily. Um, I will take disparate elements that don't seem like they go together and throw them in a box and shake it until a story comes out. So in the case of that title story, it was the child who had a terminal disease. It was the grail. It was a stray dog. It was leprechauns. Throw them in a box, see what pops. And that's the story that came out. So some of the stories are shared universe in that collection. One was the Fleet, which was strictly science fiction, which was actually an anthology of sequential science fiction about a war that the fleet was fighting. So I picked one crazy character and threaded it through that entire series. And the other was I was asked to write for Wendy and Richard Peeney's Elf Quest. Wendy knew she wasn't going to get to all of the chieftains that came before Cutter. So she assigned different writers that she liked to write those chieftain stories. And so that's why there's ElfQuest pieces written okay. into, and people go, oh, you took from ElfQuest. No, I was asked to write, look at the copyright page. It was all approved. It was all above boards. So there's every kind of thing in that anthology and it, or that collection, and it was all kind of shoved into one volume. And so it's sort of a sampler Okay. But it's nothing like my novels. I was going to say, I had no idea, I guess, what this was. I was assuming it was just a bunch of like Arthurian short stories. I didn't realize it was a whole mix. It's all different um, things. So that is, that has me even more excited to read this. But I love you know, that. I said, there's one in there called The Wayfinder, and I took the Polynesian, the guy who would be on the Polynesian boats who could read the wind and the current and never get lost. Um, but I took it a step further than that, that cultural lore. Um, so there's all kinds of things in there. There's every kind of thing. So it's a real grab bag. That sounds, I mean, that sounds absolutely fascinating. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I, I've planned on obviously reading all of these because I haven't gotten to a lot of the other ones yet. But I, I love that it's the painting again that kind of uh, caused the book to go. And that spins back to what you we were talking about with both art and, and uh, writing, but I, I just love the idea of a painting so good. It just has to have a story. That's such a cool way to have something to come out or decide to write a book too uh, with it as well. And speaking of amazing paintings, I still, the, the one that started it all for me, we kind of talked very briefly about, but Cycle of Fire, which uh, I, I do love the, the individual arts, but this kind of com combo cover, I absolutely love to want to talk about this a little bit before we get to Hell's Chasm and talk about the giveaway for it as well. Because this was, like I said, this is the first thing I ever picked up. And I picked it up by chance because I loved the cover. I, I saw it and I was really curious and I looked and just immediately found it. And this is, uh, even though this is, you know, this is earlier and I know you've said that this is definitely a different audience than Words of Light and Shadow. Um, and it's one that's kind of easier for people who aren't ready to, for the league to get into as well. But even with that, it still has some, you know, beautiful writing in it. And it still has uh, that kind of feel of, once again, presenting as the most classic of classic fantasy tropey type stories, but being anything but as well, just in different ways. Uh, so uh, what were uh, what were some of the inspirations here on this one? Um, being just as unique uh, as a oh, you want to see? You want to see? Okay. Here you go. This is the whole reason for that trilogy. Oh yeah, I've got. I've got my small copy. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That was a storm that came in in the summer on Nantucket, and unless you think I was. <clears throat> One of these people that owned a mansion on Nantucket, I didn't. I used to go there to open houses. So I was there in the off season scrubbing floors and cleaning out refrigerators with rotten steak in them that people left in there, scraping the walls and repainting everything because the houses were turned off in the winter and the mold would just come in. So oh, yeah. I was there six year, six weeks every year opening houses and I got paid tremendously well. So this storm came in over Nantucket and I had phenomenal photographs of it. And I lived in the carriage house apartment of an author named Daniel P. Mannix, and he wrote wildlife and all kinds of um, men's magazine hunting articles. And he had ocelots and foxes and 
falcons outside the door. I got to watch falconry in practice outside the door. So he had a huge garden with a giant fence and a goshawk got in there and was killing his chickens. And it had one eye, that's why it was starving. So I got to watch him manning that goshawk in the backyard, right outside my window, and that's the goshawk. So I said, well, I'm just gonna do this painting and what if there was this wizard that controlled the weather and he had the weather ride on these birds and then here came Cycle of Fire, and it turned out he was not the hero. There are three kids, all of them flawed. So it became a coming of age, but with a little bit more depth to that, because me being me, I got to go Maverick on it. It <laughs> reads like a fantasy, but actually what you find out is there was a gigantic war, and humanity was losing, and the aliens who were psychically connected were killing them. And the only way to hide, to hide something from beings with eidetic memory that are telepathic is to bury it in myth and legend because it's going to be dismissed. So that is what happened on this world to hide the things that really counted until the solution was found for this galactic war. And there's actually a fourth volume of this that I have not written yet. It's straight science fiction. Whoa, yeah, it's called Star Hope. And it opens in a way you are not going to expect if I ever get a chance to write it. But it's this series is so buried. It's so lost in the mix. It came out at the same time as the Empire series, and it wasn't the Empire. And at the time, it was a, designed as a duology. The publisher decided arbitrarily to make it a trilogy. And we had this massive fight because um, Stormwedden came out, sold out immediately, and they held the reprint until the second book. And then they decided three books. And I didn't want to make it three books unless I rewrote the second book as a proper trilogy. And they just wanted said, pat it out 100 pages and throw it out there. We don't care. Mm. So there was this massive legal battle in the background between my agent and them so that I could do it properly. So it got delayed unduly because of that argument. And so in some ways, it sort of derailed my solo career. Everybody to this day thinks Empire was my first book. It was, not, it was like my fourth or fifth. So here we go. Um, Storm Warden is different than anything else. But that's somewhat yeah. the, the inspiration and the underpinnings behind it. So that'll give you an idea. That is that that was uh, as just a super fun story from <laughs> inspiration there. I, it's been it's that's been really fun kind of hearing all the little things. There you go, guys. If that sounded interesting, check out Cycle of Fire because it is like I said, there's so much to it. Real first nautical, absolutely real oh, nautical. Yeah. I have done offshore sailing in small yachts. Believe it or not, the first time I sailed all my life small boats and I taught windsurfing. I was a certified windsurfing instructor back when that okay. was okay. original. Yeah, I did all kinds of things. I was a, a certified Hobie Cat instructor for Hobie Cat sail, sailboards. We had a boat shop local, they would hire me. Somebody bought a new boat, they, it would come with a lesson so they didn't kill themselves. Whole other set of stories, you know, when some big he-man buys this boat and they send this little tiny girl out there to teach him how to use it, it was kind of funny. Um, funny, funny anecdotes from that time. But anyway, I first did offshore sailing seriously because of the scene that occurs in Destiny's Conflict. You will know it when you see it. Ooh. Once I got the offshore logged mileage, you become in demand as crew. I could literally do this as an occasional vacation. Yacht needs another crew member to go from A to A. They pay for your airfare to get you home. And you sail the boat there. So Storm Warden and all of the nautical scenes actually have a basis in actual hands-on. Because um, I went on and I, I've crewed for period rigs and gone offshore in period rigs as well. So I definitely know what it's like to climb up the rigging barefoot in a square rig ship. I have done it. Looks like we lost Nico. So I, th my computer decided to have a freak out here. But yeah. Uh, did you, did you hear what we, where we were? Yes, I, I could hear everything. Thankfully. Good. Okay, uh, he's trying to fill in time for you there. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I've done hands-on on those ships. I've even done hands-on in period clothes on those ships. That is so cool. 
Um, it's, uh, it's, I was, I, I plugged in my, my second screen and then my computer decided it didn't like that because I was getting ready for the wheel spin. And so that part will be interesting. Uh, but so we have just bought the first three books in Words of Light Chat and we cannot wait to get started. Ah, uh, I can't wait to, to hear yeah. either. So much great. That's perfect because the first three really function well as a trilogy. Because when you come in at arc four, the markers are all going to move severely. So the first three books is a really good way to dive in. Definitely. Uh, and then we have, if you had to pick your favorite book of yours for a new reader, uh, which one would it be? <laughs> which I feel like is a very loaded question. <laughs> it is because it depends what you like to read. If you're a John Gwynn fan, pick up Master of White Storm. If you like political intrigue, and you want something that's a beach read, go with Sorcerer's Legacy. If you want a coming of age, go with Cycle of Fire. If you want to dive off the deep end and you want to really immerse yourself in a, in a read that's not going to give you everything up front, but it's going to develop and astonish you, then and you have the patience for it because it won't let you skim, then go for The Wars of Light and Shadow. My offhand recommendation, if you are not a fantasy reader is try either the Empire series or the short stories or to ride Hell's Chasm. And the reason why I mentioned those is because those were the books that my family got along with and they do not read fantasy. Everything else was too fantasy for them. So my dad and my brothers, they're the books that they clicked with because there was something in them that was a little easier for them to grasp. So that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, the short stories, you know, they all love them, and they said, or they said, why didn't you do more like Hell's Chasm, or why didn't you do more like Empire? Those seem to be the ones that are universally um, quick pickups. Yeah. So start there, and once you you've been through those or started with one of those, then you know to trust my plotting. I don't do beginnings. I drop the hammer at the end, and I'm going to break your back at the half point where things are going to really explode open. But many books today are so front loaded that the ending falls flat. And I don't do that. So there's a certain amount of trust that a reader will oh, yeah. build up going through my work, knowing I'm going to deliver. I'm just going to make you wait for it. And that's going to make the book memorable is that searing ending. That's where you want the hammer to fall. That's what the whole purpose of reading. You don't want a cliffhanger. You don't want a book that's a half a story. You want something that just resoundingly brings you to earth at the end. 100%, 100%. And then we had uh, Tori with a legendary author interview parent. Oh, well, thanks, Tori. So though, speaking of Tride Health's Chasm, we do have the signed hardcover and the uh, paperback, which is also a nice copy. Not quite as nice as the signed hardcover though. Uh, that we are giving away. So let's talk a little bit about To Ride Hell's Chasm and get ready to uh, spin the wheel and see uh, which lucky person is is going to be getting a copy of, well, what, which two lucky people, I suppose, are going to be getting copies of those. So yeah, well, that was the fun, most fun I ever had writing a book. It outpaced me every day. Every day I stopped, it was still writing. Every morning I woke up, I was still scribbling notes. It just wrote like a house on fire. And um, in some ways it was inspired by Guy Kay's Lions of El Rassin, that, that classic ending that he had, that moment for those two characters, you know they're going to collide. So that paired with the Tevis Cup, the Tevis Cup is an endurance race where the horses race 24 hours, 100 miles over brutal terrain. They literally climb a mountain in the desert and come down the other side. And they have vet wow. checks so that horses don't die. And I thought, what if that kind of a brutal run, if the fate of a kingdom rested on those horses? So there was that thrown in. And then everything else popped in on top. So I call it sort of a fantasy version of 24 because the plot runs huh. in five and a half days. It was also sparked by a rebellion on my part because I was just finished Peril's Gate and many long form fantasy writers were not finishing their series or not 
producing or they were wandering off track and, you know, people complain this series or that has books that feels like they were too padded. I don't know. I'm not going to say they wrote what they meant to write and probably the reader wasn't in sync with it. But they were accusing the Wars of Light and Shadows is never going to be finished. Words has lost control of the plot. She has no idea where she's going. And I'm going, they have no idea. No idea how tightly woven the entire tale is. I know exactly where I'm going. So I did this one off quickly to say, look, I can stick an ending and I can do it in a five and a half day plot and I can make it as complex as you want. And also I was emotionally ragged finishing Peril's Gate. I needed the break. And also Peril's Gate marked the moment in the US where HarperCollins merged with Avon and they let a lot of authors go. They went from 36 HarperCollins A-list writers and 18 Avon A-list writers. They combined the list and said 12. We're keeping 12. That's how many writers were kicked off the track. So I had no US publisher for that time period. So I wrote House Chasm to try to replace that with an editor. And lo and behold, here came 9-11, publishing froze for two years. So that deal never happened. So that's why we had the Misha Merlin version. It was to get it out there so my readership had something to read. So there were a lot of things that poured into that book and uh, a lot of heart in it. And the horse scenes are absolutely real. 100%, I've ridden all my life. I was going to say, I would expect nothing nothing less than 100% real uh, when it comes to that kind of thing, for sure. So if you pick up this book, enjoy it. Um, it's, it's a lot of dynamite packed into one cover, and it definitely is a standalone. I have no intention of writing anything more. That's it for that, for that universe and those people. Well, I mean, that, that's, yeah. Uh, uh, one, I, I knew a little bit, but hearing that background skin just has me super excited. That's kind of the problem is every book we've talked about a year is I'm like, oh, I want to read this so bad. Um, <laughs> so there's only, there's only, there's only so much time, but. Books uh, are never too late, nor are they early. Very true. And that, that's the great thing is I, I know I still have plenty of time. Um, but so with all of the information on Tride Hill's Chasm, we did have a, a fair few entrants. This once again is signed, it is a hardcover, uh, is just a really beautiful it's got book. The big, it's got the illustrated frontispiece. So the British wraparound cover is on the frontispiece there. I'm trying to be very careful. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Look at that, that is beautiful. Uh, and we, we even have like the backs got the little color uh, pieces as well. So we have that. And then, uh, like I said, we also have my uh, my paperback version, which is not signed, not quite as nice, uh, but it's that's your that's the consolation prize, so that two people can have this uh, with it. And so, with that, let's give it away. And this is going to look a little weird for a minute because uh, I can't use a second monitor, <laughs> but we're going to make it work. Oh, actually, it did work. Okay. Okay, it it did it. So we're gonna we have uh, twenty one total entries. We're gonna spin first for the hardcover, and then we'll spin second for the paperback. And so, with uh, no further ado, let's get spinning. And it looks like our Oh wait! <laughs> oh. oh wow, that was that was right to the wire. So we have Reliable Pat is the winner of the hardcover copy. So I'll be contacting you as well, uh, and then let's give it one more spin for the paperback. Let's see if it's as nail biting as that first one because I thought you were for sure. Is it kind of? I guess I should have moved Pat. That was almost the same thing. Mike Bowman, it looks like you have won the paperback copy here. And I'm going to I'm gonna spin. Um, oh, no, I didn't actually need to. OK, well, I'm going to do an alternate. And so just in case. Uh, so Spyros is our alternate here. OK, 
You don't necessarily win anything, but it's entirely possible. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna just note that down um, here. But those are our winners, so congratulations. Um, I am so happy to be able to give these away. Uh, and I have this note, so yeah, I'll contact you guys. Uh, get these out to you, and then hopefully we'll all read around the same time, because I definitely need to read this very soon as well. Uh, super excited here, but I've been, yeah, but really, uh, really excited if, to- If your Spiros is a U.S. address, and it won't cost an arm and leg, I'll send a book. <laughs> I so say, I... address, but if it's not U.S., the postage has gotten absolutely crushing. I sent one box of books in two boxes of books yesterday and it was almost 50 bucks and that they were both us addresses they just hiked oh, media mail rates again so yeah if it's a us address uh, and i that alternate doesn't get a book let me know and i i will that. check um i know i know mike's in the us i don't know about pat or spiros um, I know we did have some international entries who specified they were international and i i was uh allowing it. I was really hoping that both wouldn't be international because that was going to get expensive, but uh, I'll, I'll have to check to see. Uh, but yeah, we've got, we, we have our winners. So, oh, we have some important things. So James showed up. Hi, James. Uh, Mark J just ordered Master of White Storm. Oh, brilliant. Really? Audio or, or paper? Let us, let us know, Mark, which version you got. Yeah, audio there. or paper um love fantasy standalones uh yeah so i love my long series but it is so nice to have a standalone every now and then for sure so it's nice to have both Danny well, all super of my standalones are, are in print they can either be had from open road media in ebook or britain has them in paper so you could get them harper collins um uk just order from their website get it that way <laughs> And now we have Andrew just rubbing it in. Uh, the it's a really cool edition of Master of White Storms. <laughs> uh, looks like Mark got a paper copy. And uh, Pepe Sylvia is very hyped to read the standalones, for sure. I am too. I am so hyped. Uh, I've just been, I, I have all these books and I want to read them, but I have to finish the big series first, but I'm getting so close, so. There's going to be a lot more Janie Wirtz reading and reviews on Janie Wirtz books in the, in the next couple of months, the rest of this year, there's, there's going to be plenty for sure. Oh man. So I'm excited. I've been really, I've been really happy to, uh, to get these books into some hands here. And I do love my copy as well uh, of the, the hardcover. So excited here, but we've, uh, we've hit, uh, I, you know, so many different things on here uh, about everything here. But we do still have, yes, uh, we do still have uh, one uh, more really big surprise. Or if you saw Janie's tweet, it might not be as much of a surprise what's coming. But uh, some pretty cool exclusive thing. So Janie has been kind enough to offer to give us an exclusive look on some information uh, for this particular uh, live stream here, which I am eagerly awaiting. I have no idea what we're going to get revealed. But this is, Jane, I believe it is going to be uh, spoiler free about Wars of Light and Shadow. This takes Mostly. place so far into the beginning because the first stage, this is the first, first, this would be the beginning of the first stage. And there are three eras that take place before this moment in time. And there's three ages that happen afterwards. The first stage was the coming of the Paravians. The second age was the coming of Fellowship. The seven, the third age was the coming of mankind. We are talking over 20,000, over 25,000 years before the series. So does it really spoil? No, it spoils nothing in the main series, but it might tip you off to certain things that were extant on this world back then. But what form they're in now and when you encounter them, it's not going to give away what you're going to encounter. So okay, Very the dragons were original to Athera. And um, I don't want to say too much about the dragons because you will learn it. But they have the power to create reality. And various conflicts, various reasons set one dragon against another. And their creations 
went to war against each other and eventually against themselves. And what you had was a world that was teetering toward destruction because the dragons were creating without love, if you want to put it baldly. So the first stage happened because things came to a head and there were dragons that wanted to put a stop to it. So I will just read you a few pages of the opening of the first stage. The dragons yearned for what they knew not. Some that were weary of pain and blood and slaughter and contention. They that dreamed and yearned in their discontent gathered at the heart of the world in the center of the Paravian continent. The site of that convocation lay between the great lake of Dianfal and the waters of Lithmarin, where the store lanes that are the axis of the world meet the plateau to the east. The site is, to this day, marked by twin standing stones above Silvermarsh. Such was the lament of the dragons united in the first mask dreaming for change that the creator heard, and in response to that cry for an inspired redemption, love answered. Ath touched Athera with the sound and light chord of prime creation. This was the first time such exalted notes had been sung since the epiphany that seeded the worlds that are now and forever in their many faceted glory. The notes of joy that rang on the air and in water and through Athera herself shaped and opened the grand gateway vortex at Athelie. All of Athera's lanes glowed with gold power and the frequency of the world became lifted to a higher octave. Now of dragonkind that heard that note and took pause, some were transported and left Athera, evolved into other existences. Others were paralyzed with ecstasy and were moved to encounter the deeps of their being and alter their fundamental perception. Many of these fell into a trance dreaming and of their collective creation emerged the golden hills of Dan Raman, a blessed land rich in beauty and fertile, and ringing with all that is fair and good and teeming with life and abundance. Those dragons that dreamed of Athelaria on earth regarded that they had shaped and chose to guard it from harm. For a century and no marauding drapeswan were permitted to roam there or enter therein and cause mischief or hunt for the thrill of blood slaughter. When Ath creator's touch raised the world, others of the dragons with more willful natures and darkened passions fell into a comatose state of unconsciousness. When these awoke, they emerged desolate for those strains of paradise they had encountered unknowing, having tasted of an ecstatic joy beyond the compass of their conscious awareness. These aged and grew bitter for the intangible loss they could never recover. They raged for what they had lost, unable to find a reprieve from an inchoate sense of exaltation, unremembered, and cruelly left unrequited. At the vortex of Athelie, where the influx of divine sound and light met the living world, the life that answered the dragon's plea for redemption entered Athera. Bestowed on the land were three gifted energies, species of consciousness not yet expressed into earthly form, called Antiony. These were the origin seed frequencies to impart the Riathan, the Athlian, and the Ilitharis. The most ethereal and refined, the Riathan, were made as the living bridge to bring Ath's presence alive upon Athera. The Athlian bore the middle frequency of celebration and divine joy that the inspired rays through song and dance should heal and renew with the seasons. The most dense of the three, the Ilitharis, were the guardians and wisdom keepers. These spirits arrived on Athera and were not embodied but were infused into the world directly from the realms of Athelaria to express as they willed and create their own way henceforward. The first dance of the triad of energies to ground and awaken Ath's gift took place in Arathura. This event aroused the planetary lanes, exalted the lane force of Athera's new resonance, and raised the crest of the first grand confluence. Athera's mysteries were awakened and called to become interactive, and the manifest energies of Ath's trifold gift of healing precipitated into incarnate form. Some few remained spirit or antiendient, and these bonded with the awakened mysteries and are named. Thus, the three old races, unicorns, Riathan, sun children, Athlian, and Elitharis, came to walk the world in form 
as the Atiendar Anami, or the first beings of actualized light. This took place on the high resonance node, later to become the site of Crater Lake where the Fellowship Sorcerer's engine crash landed, directed to Athera by the dreaming of the dragons in the second confluent dreaming raised at Corinth. So there's just a piece of it. That's not all of it, but a piece of it. Wow. Uh, I just like, oh my gosh, so many things I was thinking about. That was uh, such a great one to pick because I've been so curious about the, the origin of the phrase. Was it what you thought? And so like kind of, but also kind of not. And that's where we, as, as soon as you started getting into that, I'm just like, I was not expecting this to just be set this clearly, I guess, with some of it. So um, I that that's another one where that, that might end up spawning a video at some point. Just talking more about Well, there's that. more. There's certainly oh, more. Yeah. By the way, that was just crude draft. I just hammered that out. It was never spell checked, never checked, never read again. I just hammered it out as I was working on the planning. I, I might need to like come and try to like you know borrow all your notes to make photocopies. Uh, what's Boxes. <laughs> I would love to have help ordering it because I've placed the paper. I know where I'm going to send my author papers, and but yeah, it's all in this huge chaotic mess. Some of it's organized, a lot of it's not. Hey, because well, the problem I'm is the minute here. you look at one region or one facet, it feeds into all the others, and so suddenly you you lose your way because. The, the threads broaden out so quickly they keep forking. It's like a fractal. So where do you start to organize it? Because it's fractal shaped. Each piece becomes thousands of pieces. Very true. Very true. So uh, let's. <laughs> so Angie's saying more Janie Wirtz collabs on books. Definitely agree. Uh, Chibi Poe was very surprised <laughs> by what that we were doing this. So there's good. Uh, yeah, agree. Beautiful, very much appreciated. And you got uh, it wasn't just my wheels spinning. You have Chippy Poe too, who's like the you know OG fan of the series too. So uh, what a what a treat for for those who haven't read or for those yeah. And if you haven't read, just think about how awesome that was, um, being completely out of context and from thousands and thousands of years before the series. And think of how well, it will shade what you see. In when you read the series, because it will give you an echo of what these beings really are and what has been lost or hidden. Um, so it will add to the mystery of what you're reading. It will, I think, it will add to your experience, not yeah. take away from it. Even though there are little things that you would have discovered along the way, they aren't going to, you aren't going to see them in this depth. It'll just add meaning to what you're reading. Yeah, and that's where like I've made a couple of videos that I'm calling non-spoiler, although I'm talking about some things you're not necessarily going to know immediately, but it's uh, just stuff I think that, that I found really interesting that's explored, you know, as early as the first book too. And there were just so many things to talk about, and especially once you get later, it's hard not to talk spoilers with it, uh, getting really in depth. But this is just, yeah, this is the world. Uh, like I said earlier, I love world building so much. I love the way you do world building very specifically as well. And knowing that there's all of these bits and pieces, I just want to, I want to know all of it. So <laughs> I, I, I hope I, uh, we, we get the chance to get some more of that information later on for sure. But well, I'll definitely volunteer more. to You will get more. Time. There is so much more. So yeah, I just used exactly what I needed for the major series. A lot of this is, and I want to write more in this world. I want to do epic poetry of some of the first and second age stuff. There is such amazing material back in history and even forward in history too. Um, but I've got to get enough people aware of the series to make it even worthwhile to do it because otherwise it will just be too time consuming and the bills got to get paid. I got to keep the lights on. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But hopefully, and I, I know we've definitely had a lot of people here who are fans, but we also had some people I think who have not yet read or, uh, are, are planning to. So uh, always my hope whenever I'm talking about this, the whole reason, you know, I do booktube in general is I want to talk about books uh, that I enjoy and I'm passionate about and get people to read them. So let this be the call to everyone watching. Uh, buy some January books. You won't regret it. They're really amazing. There's a lot of options. There are some with audio, like she was saying. I mean, Cycle of Fire has audio. 
uh, and so does Master of Whitestorm. So there's same as Sorcerer's Legacy. So yeah, the five books you can get in audio now, mm -hmm. and if those books start to take and do well, Harper Collins will pay attention. But yes. when stuff comes out and there was no advertising for those books, they just vanished. So I think most people are not aware they're even there. So yeah, they're they're fun place to start. And I I helped choose the narrators for those. Either I picked one in the case of Simon Preble, I got the one I chose, or I listened to auditions. I went and picked my favorites and said, this is my wish list. And the publisher said, okay, we can't get you those guys, but it really matters that you did that because then they picked the next one on their list that was close. And that's how I got Colin Mace, who absolutely killed it for Destiny's Conflict. He did a beautiful job. I hope he does a whole series. I really, really do. So I helped curate those narrators. I recorded the pronunciations. I went every effort I could to make those good recordings. So it would make me very happy if people checked them out. You can listen to the first chapters on my website as a MP3 download. And even the first three chapters of To Ride Hell's Chasm is my recording. I am not an actor, but at least it's clean. I did it on GarageBand. So if you, if you want to try out that book on your commute, if you're not sure, to Ride Hell's Chasm is for you. You can get a print download in, for your device in all formats. You can get an audio download for the first three chapters. Go kick the tires. I encourage you because it doesn't do me any good if you buy a book and you don't love it. So try it out first. Yeah. that's uh, And it's it's one of those things, too. It's nice having the, the multiple options um, with it as well. Uh, and it, it's audio is one of those things I never thought I'd be into, but I also never thought I'd get used to a Kindle and I love my Kindle now. I still love my physical books, uh, especially, I don't know, there's something about like reading, uh, like, you know, the, your, your hard covers too, especially for like Wars of Light Shadow and a lot of others, just so beautiful. Uh, and so I, I love reading them, seeing them, having them, but, uh, uh, there's the, the audio and just the words in general, it doesn't really matter what format, uh, I've been loving everything that I've been reading for sure. But uh, yeah, it's we this has been a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, I, I do absolutely thank you for for joining me uh, on the channel. I've been really excited to talk to you. Like I said, I absolutely uh, as long as you're willing, I would like we'll reach out to you to set up a follow up uh, at some point too. So we can dig into some other things. I imagine I'm going to have a lot of things I'm going to want to talk about once I finish Song of the Mysteries too. So <laughs> well, I'll put you on the ARC list. Can yes. you guys read it if you get there and you have a channel? I uh, will get you on the a ARC list because sending the word out there is really important. And my heart goes out to you, Nico, because you are really digging into this series and you're bringing the attention to bear on the complexity of the world and the story. And the honestly, this is a series that you could reread 12 times and you would not see it all. It's like Malazan that way. A lot of the themes are similar, but they are presented way differently. It's a different feel to the story, but the underlying driving forces it often are the same. So I'm really grateful for you asking me to be here today. And I'm really pleased at what you're doing with your channel on the series, because honestly, it was written for that kind of scrutiny. Yeah. I, I can tell, and that's right. It's been so much fun going through and exploring it. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely a series that I am excited to reread. It happened, and I, since even a few books in, because it's one of those series that it builds so much, and it just makes me want to absolutely continue and uh, and just continue to, to find out more and more and reread and find out all these things. So. It's definitely a series I know I will be rereading for the rest of my life, for sure. Many times, getting something new every time, and that that for me is is the hallmark and one of the things that makes something a favorite for me is rereadability. And just if you're a person who wants to go with company, there's quite a few discussions going on right now. There's a print discussion going on on Goodreads. It's going to start August one with the first book. Um, Angie, the bookaholic is running a discussion on her channel. They just got through Peril's Gate. Um, Johanna and AP Canavan and Philip Chase are doing it. And they, I think they're going to round robin it, but they just finished with Ships of Marior. 
and Steve Talks Books Page Chewing Forum is also doing a discussion and they're doing Warhouse now three chapter sets at a time. So they're doing every two weekly. So there's all kinds of ways if you want company to go through the series um, because it is pretty deep and complex and you want to share it with people. There's lots of opportunities to do that right now and more seems to be happening every day. So. Absolutely. It is. It's very exciting. Uh, just seeing more and more people get into this series and, and your other books as well, but especially just Boards of Light and Shadow is, it's something that I, I, I just want more and more people, as many people as possible to experience um, because it's, it's, yeah, it is just absolutely amazing. And it is complex and it is something you have to be patient for, but it's also just so rewarding with each book. Um, Malison is a, a series that I could tell myself for years and need to reread at some point because I do feel like I'll appreciate it more on reread, but I I appreciated it in retrospect, not while I was reading it a whole lot of the time. Uh, but I, I also did read that years ago. And so, uh, you know, I, I love a series that has more and things you can find out, but I feel like with Wars of Light and Shadow, I'm getting rewarded i'm getting these huge moments i'm just it's such a deeply focused character story as well despite the huge scope um that it's just i've been i've been absolutely loving it so yeah every time i see somebody mention uh you one of your books one of your series or doing uh, buddy reads or anything it just makes me so happy so and i'm excited to to get uh some of these in the hands of some others as well here uh so it is uh it has definitely been fantastic uh to to just go on this bright and experience it but any uh any final thoughts on uh on any of the books we talked about anything or just anything you want to say uh to to our viewers i'm pretty much all available to people if they want to drop me a question i'm pretty much on twitter off and on just drop me a question and if i can answer it then i will um there's a paravia forum also which is dedicated to this series you can drop questions there and lots of other readers will help you out um i'm just really thrilled to be finished with the whole thing and maybe in retrospect it's a good thing to have it break out of the box now because there wasn't the distraction of a gigantic following and so i stayed very closely on track i didn't have fan complaints or fan praise or anything going to my head um through the writing of it and now that it's all finished it's all there and ready for you, for anybody to, to delve into. And by all means, read the reviews because even the ones that aren't thrilled with it might tell you that you might not be thrilled with it too. The reviews are pretty accurate. Either people love this for what it is or it isn't for them. If you try this series and you're still in your teens, I would say come back to it in your 20s. Because while there are some teen readers that do get along with it, the perspectives that it explores really are a little bit more about why things happen than what happens and how things happen than what happens. So you might find if you tried this series at 13, 14, 15, 16, that your frame of mind wasn't ready for it. And then you come back to it later and you go, where was this book all my life? Well, it wasn't written for that audience, even though some people do take to it then that was in its designated place. Do you have anything to add to that, Nico? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely agree. I feel like this is one of those things where I do think I would have really enjoyed this series still had I read it when I was younger, but I also feel like the time in my life that I picked it up was also uh, perfect because I have noticed as I've gotten older with my taste changing a little bit, uh, with the kind of stories I like more. And this is definitely a, a series that I, I think reward, it, it has so much life experience in it. And so it rewards your own life experience and will cause you to, you know, pull on your own life experience. And so I definitely think this is one that just, uh, at, you know, later in life too, I feel like maybe I'll even appreciate it even more um, as well. So I can agree with that, but it's, it's just a phenomenal series. It's beautiful. It is one to be patient with. And yes, it will not be for everyone. Um, I feel like all of my favorites fall into the not for everyone category for the most part. Uh, it's just, it tends to be, you know, not everybody's going to like everything. Even the most popular things, there are people uh, aren't going to like that. Well. So, 
Um, very true, but it's uh, Jamie's work in Wars of Light and Shadow, especially, I recommend trying out. And uh, the first book, like I said, is uh, it's, it's a great book, but you also still really won't have any idea what you're getting into until you, you get a little further in there. And um, I'll continue to do videos talking about things uh, so you can check out, try to find out some more things about it if you're interested as well, but aren't sure. Uh, and like we talked about too, Janie has a ton of books. You can try out some of his, her other stuff, just get a feel for how Janie writes and see what you think and kind of, you know, you can you can go right off the deep end or you can work your way up. There's lots of options there. If you're if you're struggling with Curse of the Mist Wraith and you're about at the one third point and you go, what's the point of this? And you don't see any reason to keep going. Some people hit that point because they have to know all the answers right now. Go read The Gallant. It's a novella. It's short. Mm -hmm. It's 100 pages. It's available off my website for cheap. Um, that will put a context around that first third of Curse of the Mist Wraith that will help you over that period where you're not sure why you're being shown things. Most readers can read right through that and they're willing to wait for it. But if you find that what's the point here, read read that short because it might, it's might smooth the way. Because it takes you back 600 years in history and it shows you what the political situation was before things got broke. And it has very personable characters. It's Varian's backstory. So if you don't know what Varian is doing in the middle of this swamp, this is going to explain that and, and warm your heart to that character very quickly. So, and it's also going to have a really strong female lead. Um, so give it, it's a fabulous story in its own right. Yes, thank you very much, um, a, a PL, thank you. It's a good intro. And it will give you, it will set your feet on the ground in this world in a way that gives you a little more footing for that first volume. So if you're not yeah. sure, try that one. And I, 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 I said some similar things video with, it is, it's one where if you read it after, um, you still, like, you might get a little bit more out of it, but at the same time, it works as kind of a good introduction. And that, at least for what I've read so far, I think is one of the best because it's actually set in the world. And, you know, there are some elements that are a little bit more of the focus because it's a short, um, but yeah, a really good way to, to try it out. But, and then if you do start any of these series, come talk to me in Discord about it too, because I could talk forever uh, about all of these things. So let me know uh, comments in Discord uh, or reach out because yeah, I am, uh, I'm always excited to talk about more of this stuff. But yeah, once again, Janie, thank you so much. Um, this has been a blast. I've been looking forward to this moment for a long time. Uh, and I had been uh, like dreaming about interviewing you and, and just talking to you like this long before I knew it was ever going to be a possibility too. So this has been fantastic. I've absolutely loved it. And I look forward to uh, talking to you more in the future as well. Well, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Bye, everybody.